Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Approaching the end of his early Greek work, the Monologian, after arguing that the rational creature was created in order to love the supreme good, that is, love God, Anselm uh, argues that we're going one of, of two places eventually, either towards eternal happiness or beatitude, or towards its opposite, eternal misery or unhappiness. And he talks about this in terms of plenty and poverty. This is actually a theme that Anselm developed at, at great length in, in some of his later works and uh, distinguished the parts of, of happiness and of misery. Um, we're not going to go into that too much here. We're interested in the structure of his argumentation about this. How are we going to arrive at the point where you're either getting one or the other? So he starts out in, in chapter uh, 69 by talking about the happiness end of it. And he says that the human creature was made to love the supreme essence without an end. And he has an argument that he provides for that here. Uh, what, is, what is that argument? Well, he says that, um, here we go. Uh, it must have been made in order that it would love the, the supreme essence, since it must have been made either in order that it might love without end, or that it might at some time lose this love, whether willingly by force. Those are the two options. So the question is, can it uh, lose this love for the supreme essence? And, and you might say, well, why couldn't it? I mean, people lose their faith all the time. They say that they love God, and then they, they do other things. Anselm himself in his prayers and in you know, other, other discussions says that um, he himself is a sinner and has, has you know, departed from, from the love of God. So, so why couldn't we actually do that? So Anselm says... It's not the case that the supreme wisdom would make the rational being in order that it might at some time either disdain so great a good or lose it by force, even, even though it wills to hold on to it. So, so long as the creature does indeed will to love, to continue to love the divine good, that's not going to be taken away from it. And he says that means that it's going to have to live forever. Uh, because otherwise, it would have this love at some time taken away from it, right? But, well, all of its being is taken away from it if it were to cease to exist. And that would not be just. The supreme being would not create us in such a fashion where that actually was a live possibility. It's certainly something we can imagine, but Anselm is ruling it out as a live possibility. So this is going to be a, a eternal life, as he says. The only remaining possibilities are made in order it might love the supreme essence without end. Uh, it's been made in such a way that it, it will always live if it always wills to do what it was made for. So long as the creature continues to love God, and presumably after, you know, in, in heaven or something like that, the creature is just going to continue to, to love God. So he says... Um, Going on a little bit further, what sort of life will it have? After all, what good is a long life unless it is truly secure against the onslaught of troubles? Remember, this is somebody writing, by the way, in the 11th century, uh, a time when troubles that, that you know they had are things that we sort of take for granted as not being a big deal. Um, so Anselm is very cognizant of this. He says, if someone, as, uh, if someone as long as he lives is subject to troubles that he either fears or suffers, or else is deceived by a false security, 
Is his life not miserable? So, you know, the, the human creature, by loving God, is not going to be made miserable in this, you know, living forever. Rather, the human creature is going to possess things securely. He says, uh, it's utterly absurd any nature always leads a miserable life by always loving him who is supremely good and omnipotent. That doesn't really make sense. Loving the supreme good is not going to make us miserable. And this is an, an interesting uh, thing to, to say to people who seem to have uh, you know, a very duty-bound conception of we got to love the, the supreme being or God or whatever it is, and their lives are miserable. There must be something out of joint there, he would say. So he says, it's therefore clear the human soul is such that if it preserves what it was made for, so long as it continues to love God, that is to continue to know God, understand God, remember God, it will at some time live happily, truly secure from death itself and all the other troubles. Uh, in, in chapter 70, he fleshes this out a bit. What is this going to be like? So he starts off by asking, is the supreme essence going to give any sort of reward or recompense to the rational creature who loves it? And again, he thinks about, well, what would it make sense to do? Does it make sense that it would just say, oh, uh, nice that you love me, don't really care, uh, not a big deal for me? Uh, I'm the supreme essence, of course, you know, so you loving me doesn't, doesn't provide me with anything. Well, you know, we know that God is infinitely just. God is, is supreme justice itself, so it wouldn't really make sense. I mean, a human being, somebody does them a good turn, they ought to do them a good turn. Uh, it doesn't make sense to say that God wouldn't do that. So he says, um, here we go, if he gives no reward to one who loves him, he who is most just doesn't distinguish. Doesn't distinguish what? Doesn't distinguish between one who loves what he what ought to be supremely loved and one who disdains or contemns it, one who pushes it away. Nor does he love one who loves him, either that or it does no good to be loved by him. And he says these things are incompatible with the divine nature. So the divine nature must give some sort of reward to the person who loves the divine nature. Now the question is, okay, so what kind of reward would that be? I mean, is it having this, this eternal life? That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Um, is it a life of eternal beatitude? You know, being free from, say, pain or sickness or disappointment, all, all these sorts of things that, that bedevil us in, in this life? Well, it's, it's something even better than that, according to Anselm. As a matter of fact, this is almost you know, exceeding the, the notion of like giving that so that you get something in return. Because what the human being gets in loving the divine essence is so much greater than whatever it is the human being can contribute. So he says, um, what does he give as a reward? If he gave a rational essence to nothing in order that it might love him, what will he give to someone who does love him if he does not cease to love? He says, um, what will the benefit of love be like? For the rational creature, if the rational creature, which is useless to itself without the, this love, is so eminent, eminent among all creatures, nothing can be the reward of this love except that which is super eminent among all natures. Something which is greater than the rational being. Well, what could that be? Well, as it turns out, that is going to be the supreme good. What is greatest among all natures? What is supereminent? God. God himself. God gives God as the reward for love. You might say, oh, that, that doesn't sound like such a great a reward. Well, Anselm goes on to, to explain why that would be such a great reward. He says, who loves justice, truth, happiness, and incorruptibility in such a way that he does not desire to enjoy them? God is justice itself. Just, you know, if we only take one of the divine attributes. So what that means is loving justice, not just in the forms that we see it here, but loving justice in itself uh, means that the reward for that is that justice itself gives itself to you the lover to enjoy. Uh, and we can say similarly for everything else, wisdom, rationality, uh, life itself, simplicity. 
all of these things are given, uh, not by God, but as God, you could say. So he says, what will the supreme goodness give as a reward who love, to, to one who loves and desires him, if not himself? Anything else he might give would not be a reward, since it would not recompense the love or console the one who loves him or satisfy the one who desires him. Either that, or if he wills to be loved and desired so he might give something else as a reward, he does not will to be loved and desired for his own sake, but for the sake of something else. God wants living human beings, rational human beings, to desire God as the greatest good so that God can, in fact, give himself, itself, whatever we want to call it, to the rational being. Um, so the reward here in this case is, you might say, for things to go the way that they are intended to go. For the rational creature to be essentially connected up with, with God. Um, so he goes on and he, he uh, I'm going to skip over a little bit. He says in, in chapter 71, now we get to the bad side, the eternal misery, the, the going to hell side, right? He says, um, it follows that a soul that disdains the love of the supreme good will incur supreme misery. Uh, one might say that for such disdain, it would be more justly punished if it lost its very existence or life. And Anselm considers this, this issue. Is it better, does it make more sense that the rational creature who disdains, and the word that he uses there is contemnere, contem, contemnens is a participle, uh, contemns the supreme good, it incurs eternal misery, or does it make sense that they would lose their existence altogether? Anselm says, it doesn't really make sense for them to lose existence altogether because then they're not really being punished, are they? Um, and so you might say, well, he's got you know, sort of a punitive model in mind. No, it's really about justice. It's really about God being God and the rest of creation being the rest of creation. So he says that... Um, Certainly before such a creature existed, it could neither be a fault or experience punishment, but if a soul that disdains what it was made for dies so that it experiences nothing or is nothing at all, it will be in the same state both when it is most greatly at fault and when it is without any fault. Um, so he says, uh, nor would the supremely wise justice then distinguish between what is capable of no good and wills no evil, that is the non-existent creature, and what is capable of the greatest good, and yet at the same time wills the greatest evil. That is, turns away against God, turns after some other created goods that are lesser goods. Um, Anselm is saying here that it would not be justice on God's part not to punish. It's not that God is vindictive and, you know, if you're not going to play by my rules, I'm going to screw you over or something like that. It's rather that the, the creature, by you know, choosing the wrong things, is going to bring upon itself what has to be that case. Um, you know, the real, what the creature is being deprived of is, in essence, God. The, the reward that the lover of God is, is receiving. So he goes on and he says, it's quite obvious that, you know, this has to be the case. Nothing could seem more logical, nothing should be believed more certainly than this. The human soul is made in such a way that if it disdains to love the supreme essence, it will suffer eternal misery. Just as one who loves him will rejoice in an eternal reward, one who disdains him will suffer under an eternal punishment. And just as the former will experience immutable plenty, the latter will experience inconsolable poverty. Things will be bad for it in every way you might say conceivable or possible. Um, so Anselm is saying for the rational creature, there's no opt out. There's, there's ultimately one way or the other way. And one way is the greatest reward possible. The other way is the greatest penalty possible. Um, now there's other issues that could be raised at this point that, that you know, go beyond this, like well why might somebody you know, choose to do things wrong in this case. The Anselm does discuss that in plenty of other uh, uh, issues in, in other texts. Um, and he also does want to stress, this is later on in the Monologium, 
Anselm says, look, we can't really know who is getting what with any degree of certainty because we're not actually God. We can have some guidelines if you're going around. He doesn't say this, but here's an example. You're going around just stabbing everybody, just, you know, stabbing, 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 stabbing. You're probably getting the eternal misery because that's incompatible with, with loving God, right? Um, but there, there could be all sorts of people who... Um, you know, think that they're going to, to eternal happiness that, that aren't going there. There could be some people who think that they deserve eternal misery and they will be saved um, and uh, made good in, in the end, made worthy of, of, of uh, doing that, made, made able to love the divine good and thereby to, to participate in this. So he's not saying that we can know who actually fits in one side or the other, but he is saying, look, there's two categories and you, uh, you're going to pick one of them depending on whether you love the supreme good as the supreme good or whether you reject it, whether you contemn it, whether you uh, disdain it, whether you choose something else in its place.